Welcome to Covenant Church, Arizona. This week, Pastor Lane and Merrill continues the series, Moments. Let's listen in. Open your Bibles to Psalms chapter 51 uh, and verse 17. 51 and verse 17. Today, our title is this, Moments That Break Us. Moments that break us. And so I want to show you how this is a positive thing, but I also want to start with this beautiful scripture uh, that David, uh, the psalmist, wrote for us. And it's in verse 17, and he says, my sacrifice, everybody say sacrifice. sacrifice. Oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. How many have ever been humbled before in your life? Uh, uh, I like to uh, uh, humble myself rather than be humbled. Of course, I always seem to uh, present those opportunities for myself uh, uh, often, it feels like. (laughs) I feel like God is usually like, this is going to be funny. Uh, And so he's watching my life play out. The other day I was going to work out. And I was going to go lift some weights. And on my, of course, on, when you're going to go work out, right, you listen to music that's going to get you pumped. Well, my wife and I, we share a playlist. Uh, all of our songs are merged. I have her songs. She has my songs. And so when I got in the car to get amped up on the way to go work out, I was headed there and our playlist synced and the Bluetooth came on. And the first song that came on as I'm driving and making turns is uh, The Little Mermaid. And so <laughs> Little Mermaid starts to play and I'm making these turns. And by the time I'm done like turning and I'm on a nice straightaway, that's when I've already begun to get into the song. And so I'm, I'm singing the song, part of your world. And I'm like really getting, <laughs> I have my windows because it's beautiful outside. I have my windows like cracked down and I'm like rolling to like, and I'm blaring the Little Mermaid. And then all of a sudden this car of college students <laughs> pulls right next to me at the light. I'm like, part of, and I say, come on kids, sing out loud kids. Everybody (laughs) sing with me. They look in the back seat and no one's there. I roll up the windows. I move on. (laughs) You ought to be broken before God. Sometimes there are going to be moments that you have, you humble yourself (laughs) and moments that God humbles you. In this world, we, we don't really appreciate anything broken. In fact, broken things are despised or thrown away. Uh, anything we no longer need. How many are the throwaway king and queens out there? If it's not been used in like over a 30 minute period, I, I am like, throw it away, throw it away, throw it away, throw it away. I am the opposite of a hoarder. Normally when Emily's like, where did that go? I, I had, and I'm like, I threw everything away. Yeah. If it was on the counter, it's gone. We don't, we don't value that. We, we normally don't like damaged goods or, or we reject them. And, and that sometimes includes people. In fact, in marriages and relationships. And when they break down, we tend to walk away and find someone new rather than work on reconciliation. The world is full of broken people with broken hearts and broken spirits and broken relationships. And what we really, what we end up doing is we use this phrase, we, we want to have it together. How many have ever used that before? I, I just want, I, I want to have it all together. I just want to look like I've got it working out. I remember uh, when I was uh, going into high school. In fact, look, can we just give a hand for all of our graduates today? Good job graduating this week. High school and junior high. I remember my first day in high school, uh, I, I, I was humbled. <laughs> I went in and I thought, because I, junior high, I was the king. So I'm going to high school and I'm going into a new school in a new city in Dallas, Texas at a private school. So we had to wear our red tie, Oxford shirt, blue blazer, khaki pants, uh, and loafers. And so when we, had to, when we went in, I was all dressed up. I had my Jansport backpack on one shoulder, right? I used to you one shoulder with the lean, right? And I was walking through the hallways. The difference between me and most other high school students as I was five feet tall and 85 pounds. And so I went through his uh, private school was K through 12. And so when I got to the school, I showed up to the high school wing and I was like, okay, man, I got this. And I'm walking, I see this group of girls and I'm like, okay, here we go. And so I start walking towards these girls and then they're in like 11th or 12th grade and they start coming towards me. So I'm like, oh, this is a great day. So I start walking towards them and all of a sudden they come up to me. Oh my gosh, you are so cute. They were like, come here, come here, come here. Like, unfortunately, the junior high is this way. We'll take you down this way. And they start to lead me down to junior high. And I'm like, get off me. I'm in high school. Y'all don't even look that good anyway. And I'm 
I walk off thinking I'm big and bad. You know, because we don't want anybody to, uh, to see us as anything less than, right? We don't want them to see our imperfections. We don't want them to see us for our faults or for our failures. We want to look like we've got it all together, like everything is okay, everything's good, right? When people ask you, how are you doing? Good, right? How are you doing? Okay. Uh, we don't want anybody to really see that we're totally broken inside. So we square our shoulders back. We dress nice. We have the walk. We behave the right way. We act calm. When really we're like a, a duck on a pond, that looks so smooth on the surface, but we are viciously and ferocious. We're, we're pedaling and we're, we have this uh, whirlwind of motion going on underneath just to barely keep moving. And, and that's how our lives tend to be is sometimes we just need to show who we really are. We need to be broken. We need to allow brokenness as a part of life. But being broken before God is our choice. Being broken is a part of life. Touch your neighbor you like and say, you broke, bro. <laughs> you broke. <laughs> Some of you are like, you know my bank account? <laughs> you, you may be broken. But you, you know what? Brokenness, if, you have, if you've lived long enough, you know that this, this it comes with life. But it's up to you whether you're going to do it alone or do it with God. Whether you're going to put your life in your hands or in God's hands. Because why be broken before God? Let me tell you, because God gives grace to the humble. Because breaking who I am before God will always give him the opportunity to build a better me because what I have to surrender to him isn't anywhere close to the value of what I will receive from him. Psalms 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in the spirit. Isaiah 57, 15 says, He lives high in a holy place, but he is close to him who is contrite and lowly in spirit. One of our pastors in Colleyville, the pastor of Colleyville Covenant Church, he wrote a book, God's, uh, My Breaking Point, God's Turning Point. And you know what? I want to share this with you today. Your breaking could be your making. If you allow it today, your breaking could be your making. Allowing yourself to be broken before God could be the making of who you are. God uses the illustration throughout the Bible of grapes and olives to show the pressing and the breaking of the grapes to become wine and olives to become oil. The three stages we see of olives are the first one, you see olive oil. Then there's a next stage that you see virgin olive oil. Then you see extra virgin olive oil. And you've seen it in scripture, you just may not have noticed. How many have ever heard of scripture start with fresh anointing? Yeah. Or new anointing? Or fresh oil? The real translated word for that in Hebrew is Ranan. R-A-A-N-A-N. Ranan. And what it really means, a more accurate definition would be green. Have you ever seen extra virgin olive oil? It's green because sometimes we feel like I've been broken. I don't want to be broke again. But sometimes even in our brokenness, God may be taking us to another stage and another level and a new season. He's saying, I know you've been broken before, but if you'll trust me one more time, I've got something much better for you. I've got something much greater for you. And we have to be able to trust God and lay our lives in his hands because I believe that the Lord is about to turn your breaking into your making today. I believe that somebody in here is about to turn some things around and God is going to be able to respond Bond in your brokenness and show you how great he is. I believe God is going to break some old paradigms and thought patterns. I believe God is going to break some old habits. I believe God is going to break some of the old ways off of you. I think God is going to break the way we used to do church and do it new. Do it in a fresh way and in a powerful way, in a great way. Not a church that's judgmental and points and says, not you, you're not good enough. A church that says, God loves you just the way you are. And in your brokenness, you can be made whole. Man, I'm going to preach today. Ha <laughs> ha First Sunday of summer, welcome. You know what? And, and I believe that God in this young church, when we're only, this is our third month in this building, we continue to grow every week and every time. And we're even launching a third service in August because you know what? There's a movement happening of fresh anointing, of fresh oil that's being poured on you through a fresh new breaking of what we used to see. But I want to show you first three different pictures of how we can respond. 
and how we've seen others in the Bible respond. So this first picture, I'm going to have to be real with you, it's not pretty. And it's not good. And it doesn't end well. I want you to look with me in Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27 verse 1 says this, Early in the morning all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans on how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and said to them, I have sinned, for I have betrayed innocent blood. He was broken in that moment. Judas, I, I, there's a lot of false theology and doctrine out there that Judas didn't have a choice. Judas all, definitely 100% had a choice. Number one. Number two, he still had a choice. What would the picture look like without reading the next verse if Judas had said, forgive me, Lord. If Judas wouldn't have taken his own life in his own hands, but taken his life and put it in his hands. But we see this picture where Judas then, all of a sudden in verse 5, it says Judas threw the money at the, into the temple and left. And then he went and hung himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, it is against the law to put this into the treasury since it's blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy a potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. You know why the scripture is so important that it puts it in there? You ever studied uh, clay making and not just from the movie Ghost? But you ever seen uh, some of the older crowd here? So when, uh, when there's clay making, they have a, a mold of clay and you give it three opportunities. If it shapes and molds, great. If not, you do it again. You give it a second chance. You give it a third chance. This wasn't a day that the potter's field was full of like, oh, we just need a new color. You know, we need some new dishes. They had one of everything. You know, this was, I had one plate. I had one bowl. I have one fork. I have one, right? So they're, they're not throwing extra away. This was a place of broken vessels that refused to be molded. Did you ever heard the Bible talk about how we're clay in the potter's hands? And it talks about how this potter's field is such a perfect parallel for the life of Judas. He had a chance time and time and time and time again. Even Jesus said, Judas, this is what you're going to do. Judas still did it. Judas had a moment and Judas didn't take the moment. He decided to take his life in his own hands instead of take his brokenness before the Lord. I believe 100% with, it, with all my heart, knowing my God, knowing my Savior, that if Judas would have gone humbled himself and said, please forgive me. I know the Savior that was on the cross, nailed and pierced in his side, who said, forgive them for they know not what to do, what they do. That Savior would have forgiven him in the moment. In fact, the moment he thought it, the moment he was coming to him, like the prodigal son, the moment he turned to run home is the moment he was accepted. But running away from your problems is a race you'll never win. Running away from your sin is a trap you'll never escape. Refusing to be broken before the Lord in those broken moments will lead you down a path you don't want to be in a place of broken vessels. I, I, can I just implore you? Take your brokenness before God. We're going to see two other great pictures of how to do this. But I encourage you and I implore you, do not go down that road of I'm going to silently suffer by myself and I'm, I, we don't talk about our family issues with anyone. We don't talk about our personal problems. Come on, how many grew up in a home? We don't talk about it with other people. We don't share what's going on in our life. We, we keep things to ourselves. And pretty soon you find yourself isolated alone in a potter's field wondering how you got there. We have to be broken before God. And let me show you another picture. Write this down in your worship journal. 2 Samuel chapter 12 verse 7. This is kind of towards the end of a story and I'll explain here in a minute. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man and not in a compliment, let me tell you. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. 
I gave you your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all of Israel and Judah. And look at this scripture. Somebody ought to highlight this because this could be a passage for your life. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you more. I don't think a lot of people recognize that in the Bible that while David had plenty, the Lord said if he wanted more and needed more, he would have given him more if he'd had his heart right. So then he goes on, he says, why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the Lord, or the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your of very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. And he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all of Israel. Wow. You ever had somebody try to pick a fight with you? This is the king of Israel. <laughs> And this guy walks in and says, you, calls him out on the carpet. What he did, what had happened is David had looked down, saw Bathsheba bathing, said, I want her. Killed her husband, took her as his wife. He thought he had gotten away with it. He thought no one knew. How many know your sins will catch up to you? You, all, you cannot run away. You cannot escape. It's not hidden. It's not gone. You may have had a time that's gone by, but you are about to get called out. This is serious. And you know what? I, I, I don't like being called out like that, just like anybody else. I don't, I, I'm okay with confrontation. In fact, I was, I, I was the, uh, the talkative, you know, you know, the short guy. When I was in high school, I was five feet tall, 85 pounds. I had a really good mouth and I loved to pick fights. Of course, I had big friends to finish them. <laughs> then when I got older, I was like, I don't want to fight. I'm a lover, not a fighter. And I don't want to fight. And I'm like, man, Lord, why didn't you give me this body when I wanted to fight? But I had all these people, you know, like even just recently, I was just smiling, having a good time. I wasn't laughing at anybody. And this guy tried to fight me because I was smiling. What are you smiling about? What are you happy about? Then he, I was like, hey, whoa, you know, buddy. And he was a little bit shorter and skinnier and had this scarf on. I'm like, you know, I'm not saying I'm, I'm big and I can, but I'm going to break you if you keep coming at me, okay? <laughs> well, I, and I, I wanted to. I, he kept coming after. He kept trying to pick a fight. But in that moment... I, if I would have lashed out in my anger, if I'd have responded incorrectly, I'd be in handcuffs. <laughs> but humbling myself is what gave the opportunity for me to walk away. Right? That's a blessing in itself. And David gets called out on the carpet as king. Not just a nobody. As king over all of Israel, he gets called out and says, you have been found guilty in the Lord. And everything that the prophet spoke, Nathan spoke, was about to take place. Yeah. And, it, and it's going to happen. Right. But let me tell you the key of what David, of why, what happened with David and how that changed everything. So then David said, I have sinned against the Lord. That's powerful. And you know what we read earlier, Psalms 51, verse 17, a broken and contrite heart. That was the Psalm that David wrote after being caught, wow. after being called out. He talks about how great God is and how terrible he is and how I need to be broken before the Lord. There's a lot of ways many of us have been called out. Have you responded with such incredible direction to say, okay, you got me. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have done that because let me just tell you the power in this. Let me tell you the power in this. It saved David's life, which is important to him, right? David, I'm sure, appreciated that because he was about to die. So instead of God killing him, he saves him. But let me tell you how it impacts not only David, not only Israel, but you and I. Because David was saved, David was alive later on when his son Absalom did exactly what the prophet spoke and was about to take the throne 
And David was alive, thank you Jesus, to step up and say, no, the throne goes to Solomon. And because of David repenting before the Lord, you and I have benefited from one of the wisest men to ever walk the earth. Because of his brokenness, something extraordinary came from it. Something extravagant, something powerful, an incredible man that would lead this earth and still impacts this earth today with his words. Your brokenness will lead to, to tremendous, tremendous anointing and power and victory and a remaking of you that you couldn't imagine. David, I, I'm sure he, many times he thought, I've ruined it. But then in that last moment, do you know what he said to his son Solomon? He grabbed his son's hand. He said, whatever you do, be the man. Be the man that God's called you to be. And spoke into his son on his deathbed. Look, the Lord saved David's life so that he could have a lasting impact. You might have felt like, you know what, I've totally messed up. You might have to pay for some of the things that you've done on this earth. But let me tell you, the Lord can redeem anything. The Lord can turn it around for your good. He could turn it around for your kids' good. You may have gone through some serious things in your marriage, some serious things in your life, but he can turn it around for that second, that third, and that fourth generation when you come humbly before the Lord and say, okay, God, I need to respond and allow myself to be humbled before you. I need to be humbled. And I need to allow, and, and that's a moment that we see where David, the Lord brought humility to David. Now I want to show you a moment where somebody came humbly before the Lord. You want to see? Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. I believe that we're going to receive what we need from God today. Maybe not necessarily what we want from God. And I think every day we ought to pursue getting what we need from God rather than just what I want from God. Yeah. David, David got what he needed. David needed to know that God didn't, wasn't blind to his sin. It's okay to be called out. We, I, I, if you're good with confrontation, some of you people out there, you like confrontation, maybe a little too much. Uh, you don't mind being called out because you're like, I'm ready. Let's do this. <laughs> some of you who don't like confrontation, we run away from it at all costs. Look, the Lord's not calling you into a place of confrontation with him. He's calling you into a place of brokenness with him. Can I call you into a place where you can lay in my hands and I can take care of your life? Where I can give you what you need and put you back together. And right here in Luke chapter 7 verse 36, it says, one of the, When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus over to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. How many have heard this scripture before? As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, he's thinking to himself, if this were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman, and that she is a sinner. Jesus answered his internal thought, right? Proving who he was to him. Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed them 500 denarii. The other owed 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had a bigger debt forgiven. He said, you have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. As great a love has, or as her great love has shown, but whoever, this is a key verse, but whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. You ever seen somebody who struggles to love someone? They probably haven't been forgiven very much or asked for forgiveness. Because when I've been forgiven a lot, man, it's easy to love. 
it's easy to pour out extravagant love. Then he turns to her and he says, your sins are forgiven. And he concludes with saying, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. It better to be a humble sinner than a self-righteous saint. Better to be a humble sinner than a self-righteous saint. I've lived for the Lord all my life. I, I know it's just like the, the parable of the one who prays and he's got that pompous prayer. And he's praying about how great he is and how much he gives. And then the one over here, he's praying, Lord, forgive me. I'm nobody. I'm nothing. And the Lord meets him right where he's at and says, you need to be humbled. Because you know what? I'd rather be that humbled sitter that says, you know what? I want to break this extravagant gift and I want to be able to break myself over you and just say, okay, God, I'm all yours. I don't need you to humble me anymore. I do that myself plenty. I need to go humble myself to you, right? I don't need to be broken on my own. I don't need to be broken and wandering. I need to allow God to Break me and be broken in his hands. What a p beautiful picture of an extravagant gift of brokenness. When you see these three different pictures, I hope you see yourself in it to where you see Judas and his refusal to be broken before the Lord. And you see David and David get called out on the carpet. Don't, don't in that moment, don't butt up against what God wants to do in your life. Humble yourself before the Lord. And let me ask you a question real quick, just going back to David. Who do you have in your life that can call you out. Who do you have in your life who can say, you're jacked up, you're broken, you need help. That's a wrong attitude. That's the wrong mindset. You're living it. Well, I believe God wants to break some of those mindsets. God wants to break some of those habits. God wants to break those patterns of sin in your life. God wants to break those patterns of fear and insecurity and doubt over yourself. God wants to be able to set you free. But in your brokenness, you have to say, I'm not going to do it by my own will, but I need to lay it in God's hands. I need to allow my brokenness to be before him. Because again, we despise broken things. We look at them as worthless. Broken things and broken people are a result of sin. Yet God sent his son who was without sin to be broken so that we might be healed. On the night before Jesus died, Jesus broke bread with his disciples and said, Take this, this is my body which is broken for you. He went all the way to Calvary to die so that we could live. His death made it possible for broken, sinful humanity to be reconciled with God and be healed. And without the broken body of Jesus, we could not be made whole. The Bible says, Isaiah 53, 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He was punished. The punishment that was brought on us, peace upon us, uh, by his wounds, we were healed. Only through the surrender to Christ can we be restored and transformed. The surrender requires brokenness on our part. We have to be able to allow ourselves to be broken before God. We have to allow ourselves to be broken in the hands of the potter. We say, okay, God, I need, I need your love. I need your forgiveness. I, I, I need your help. I need your mercy. I need your grace. Wherever you're at today, I, I want to encourage you that the Lord has healing for you. The Lord wants to take your breaking and turn it into your making. God wants to take this breaking point into your life and make it the turning point in your life. Now, it can be the turning point like Judas or it can be a turning point like David. It can be a turning point like for the woman who came and broke that jar over Jesus' feet. She was known. Everybody knew her. She was a sinful woman. It wasn't just a, uh, she knew. Everyone knew. And she decided to confront everybody who thought they were better. Everyone who looked down on her, everyone who said she wasn't good enough, everyone in that house who would not welcome her. Can you imagine the stairs as she came in the house holding the jar, just hoping nobody pushed her out or kept her away? And she walks silently behind and tries to find Jesus. And I can see her in the moment. She hasn't said a word to anybody because she doesn't want to draw attention. And she just kneels down and she breaks it over Jesus' feet because she says, I'd rather be broken at your feet than broken out there alone by my Self. Somebody in here is going to feel that today. Or you can say, okay, I, God, I feel like I've got it all together. I look good today. I, I actually came to church and we didn't argue. You know, we, we got here. 
But there's got to be a point in your life to say, good isn't good enough and olive oil is okay, but I want to see that fresh anointing in my life. I want to see that purification in my life that takes me to a whole nother level and another stage with you, God. I've been living for you for a while and maybe you feel like that virgin olive oil, but there's another stage that God is pushing you to to say, if you're going to be broken in my hands, I can take you to where you need to be, to where I always predestined you to be. But I've got to break off this old nature. I've got to break off the old in you. I've got to take that away and, and allow that breaking to become your true making. Because in our brokenness, that's when the truest form of who we can be takes life. I want to pray with you as we close and then the worship team's going to come and we're going to sing one more song to close out this service in worship. Just like she did when she broke that jar, she worshiped at his feet. Others looked at it as like a waste and what did you do that for? She said, no, the, even the best and the most of what I have to give is nothing compared to what he has in return. All, everything I have, if I took all of my life and all of my savings and I broke it at Jesus' feet, it's still nothing compared to what he's going to pour back into my life. It's still nothing compared to the peace that he speaks over me and the salvation that he's going to speak over to me. Nothing's, nothing's worth that. Nothing on this earth can compare to that. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? This is an opportunity for us to be broken before the Lord. And this may feel heavy today, but I hope it's heavy in, in, in all the right ways. Heavy on your heart to say, Lord, I just want to be broken before you. Lord, I'm, I'm not perfect. Lord, I have been living an okay life. Life has been good, but I am paddling under the surface, just trying to keep moving. And Lord, it looks good on top, but God, help me. I'm crying out. I'm not running into a potter's field by myself. God, Lord, I'm running into your arms and I'm running into your hands. And today, Lord, I want to be broken before you. And I want to humble myself. I want to allow myself to be broken before the Lord so that I can be remade brand new with that fresh anointing. And Lord, I thank you, God, as you speak to each and every person in here. God, Lord, we're gonna submit. We've been called out like David, and we need to deal with what we gotta deal with. We're not gonna walk away today still trying to tape and, and, and fix and glue things together. God, we're gonna leave here just shattered before you. And God, you're gonna take every one of those broken pieces and God, you're gonna mold that into a mighty, incredible, powerful individual that's strong, Lord, and ready to run the race that you've called them to. But it's only in our brokenness before Jesus that we find that true healing. So if that's you, with no one looking around, I want you to raise your hand right now. We're going to pray for you. Thank you for the hands going up all over the sanctuary. Come on, let's be real before God. Don't let life just be okay and be good. Keep those hands raised because we're going to allow this broken opportunity to say, Lord, you've got all of me and I'm going to worship you. And I want you to speak to who I am. Remake me, Lord. Somebody needs to start praying that. Remake me. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew in me a steadfast spirit, Lord. Lord, in Jesus' name, with every hand that's raised and every heart that's broken before you, laid into your hands, Lord, we pray that you would remake us and reshape us today. God, Lord, that you would take our breaking and let it become our making. God, that this breaking point will become the turning point in our life. We're not going to struggle like we used to anymore. We're not going to think like we used to anymore. We're not going to walk the same way anymore. God, we're going to live the new life that you called us to. God, we're going to walk in a new direction. God, we're going to speak differently. We're going to think differently. God, you are going to create us. You're establishing us, not just for us, but for our children and our grandchildren and the third and fourth generations, Lord. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray for healing right now in this house. Healing. Break away the old and establish the new. And with everyone in here, I want to pray for anybody who wants to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior or maybe rededicate your life to God. If you're viewing this online, I want you to prayerfully consider if the Lord's leading you into a relationship because this is going to be your opportunity for everyone to say, I want to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of my life. If that's you, with no one looking around, I want you to raise your hand right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands. 
In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I want everybody to repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I receive you now as my Lord, as my Savior, as my Heavenly Father. Forgive me of my sins. Make me brand new. I'm forever yours. And I am saved. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, can we give God some praise, Covenant Church? Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this week's message, you can find more content at covenantchurchaz.com. When you give, you help us reach other viewers like you. We pray you and your family are enriched this week.